Before we begin today, we want to thank our newest patrons, Danny, Leah, Jessica, Katrine, Featherweather, and my mom. Well, actually, my mom was already a patron, but she got a new credit card and updated her info on Patreon. So if you're already a patron, be like my mom and be sure to check your card information and update it if it's out of date. And if you're not a patron yet and you want to know more about what we're doing over there, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash podandprejudice. Also, the holidays are coming up. If you're listening to this right now, you're probably a fan of the show, so if people are asking you what you want for Hanukkah or Christmas, send them over to our Tea Public store at the link in the episode description. And now, enjoy this week's episode covering chapters 17 and 18 of Emma. Okay, so Mike and I came to the conclusion, and by Mike and I, I mean I texted this to Mike and he said it was accurate, that Doc is essentially just Chucky from the Rugrats. <gasps> oh my god, that would be an excellent Halloween costume for him. I know. No, I don't know how he'd get the little red wig on him, but he'd look so cute. Oh my God, wait, his ears would stick. There would be little holes for his ears and it would be the red wig and then his little ears sticking out. Oh man, I feel like our new way of starting the podcast is just like updating the world on my dog. Yeah. Which, you know, I don't think anybody minds. (laughs) No, absolutely not. Let's think of a Jane Austen themed segment title for Doc Updates. There are always dogs. A Doc Update. (laughs) Yes, there are always dogs. Yes, just picture Doc in every scene. Um, I hope Emma has a dog. Oh, Emma definitely has some dogs. Great. She's rich. She must. Yeah. I know Knightley is probably more likely to have dogs than Emma. Because of the farm. Also because he like is a gentleman and he hunts and shit. Oh, right. Hunting. Yeah, I was going to say because he's because he's a gentleman and therefore a dog person. But, but the Woodhouses probably have some dogs. Yeah, I'm sure. But there are always dogs. A doc, a doc, a dub date. <laughs> a doc date. A doc date. This is Becca. This is Molly. We are here to talk about Jane Austen. We are here specifically to talk about chapters 17 and 18 of Emma. Emma! Emma! Listeners, if you're new here, I, Becca, am an Austin stan. I've read many of her books over the years. And I, Molly, am reading her for the first time through this podcast. If you want to hear Molly read through Pride and Prejudice or Sense and Sensibility for the first time, you can check out seasons one and two of this podcast, respectively. But that is not what we're doing here today. No, today we are finishing volume the first of Emma. And what a volume it's been. It has been. It's been a volume. I could tell I was doing a voice in the, like, this is Becca, this is Molly. I, Molly, have never read Jane Austen before. I was like, I, Molly, have never read Jane Austen before in my life. (laughs) Listeners, we're recording by Zoom for the first time in a while, and I think it's like putting us back into a more formal mode, because when we record in person together, we are just like off the rails. We're drinking. We're shooting the shit. It's like pure chaos. Chaos. Right now, this feels so orderly. I'm drinking tea. (laughs) I'm drinking beer. Yeah, so Becca's still a little chaotic, but (laughs) are you blowing into your beer bottle? No, but I can if you want to hear it. Yeah, let's do it. Wow. Oh, good job. Yeah, I was a clarinet player for two years and I was bad at it. Nice. Well, I'm still a little chaotic too, Becca, so um, don't you worry. I last night finished A League of Their Own and I sobbed because first I was sobbing because of A League of Their Own and then I was sobbing because of like COVID scares and all sorts of things. So I was sobbing for like five hours. So today's just been unhinged. So fun fact, I rarely go into our Instagram DMs, but sometimes I go in to check around and see what's happening and everything. Uh And I saw you thirstily DM a League of Their Own podcast (laughs) from our Instagram. (laughs) Did you see my immediate backtrack when I realized they stopped releasing episodes in August? Yes. So Molly DM'd this podcast. I don't know the name of the podcast, but I know it was a league League of their own recap podcast. So great, great stuff. So she uh, DM'd them just like a paragraph about how obsessed she was with the league of their own and how desperately she wanted to guest star on their podcast and then immediately went, oh, my God, I just realized that you stopped recording. Never mind. Yeah, it was a. 
it was almost embarrassing, but honestly, I'm glad I shot my shot. Shoot my sh- I, I shot my shot. It was it was one of those moments where I was like, Molly, it was such a Molly moment. Well, because in the podcast and the the podcast host hosts another podcast called Diking Out, and she's like a very queer, fun podcaster. And she kept talking in the podcast about how was she going to need to read Pride and Prejudice to watch A League of Their Own? Because in the first episode, uh, Abby Jacobson's character is reading Pride and Prejudice, and it's like a metaphor and everything. So the podcaster was like, is this going to be based on Pride and Prejudice? It is not. But uh, I was like, but listen, if you want to talk about all the similarities or differences, like I'm happy to. Well, all that being said... um person with great podcast if you want to come on this podcast let me know yeah uh, and also like anyone want to talk to me about a league of their own because i, I can't stop just like rewatching it it's so good i i will watch it i personally have uh I'm, I'm catching up on tv i've been behind on so um i will tell you molly we have started watching andor and it is amazing i've heard like even from people that I know that don't like Star Wars, they were like, I've heard that Andor is amazing and you should watch it. And I was like, oh, it's making its way around. It's amazing a lot in the way that Rogue One is amazing Mm. and that it's like it's a Star Wars thing that doesn't fall into some Star Wars traps. Nice. But we're not here to talk about any of that. No, we are not. We're here to talk about Emma. So should we tell the listeners where we left off? Oh, we should. Elton proposes to Emma in the car. Yes. Fran, the sound effect, briefly, like quickly. Thank you. (laughs) Then Emma just like thinks to herself about what a shit show it all is and is like, what am I going to tell Harriet? Yeah, and I think that's pretty much where we are. Mm -hmm. So the weather improves and the Knightleys being Isabella and John leave, leaving Mr. Woodhouse to go back to just feeling sorry for poor Isabella, who has this perfect life and is a model of, quote, right feminine and happiness, which basically means she is happy living with her family. She doesn't see any flaws in them, even though they are flawed. She's just a little oblivious. She's also just like a happy wife and mom. Like, Yeah, she does love her life. Yeah, she's, you know, like... The idea of her being like the ideal feminine person is that she's like, you know, bearing a lot of children, raising them, having a good time, being in a good place in society and, you know, doing everything she should be doing. Good for Isabella. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So the evening that they leave, Mr. Woodhouse receives a letter from Mr. Elton saying that he's leaving for Bath for several weeks the following morning, and he regrets having to leave Mr. Woodhouse very much. The petty. The sucking up. Dear Mr. Woodhouse. I mean, the sucking up is there, and it's what he's got to do partially because he's higher class, but as we've learned, Elton is a suck up. But the decided nature in which he is trying to gaslight like, the shit out of Emma in a way that Mr. Woodhouse will not notice. Mm-hmm. Because th- there is no mention of Emma's existence in this letter. Like she has been hanging out with him nonstop for weeks or months even. And he's like, dear Mr. Woodhouse, I'm very sorry to have to leave you. And only you, just you, no one else. <laughs> you and... uh your horses and nobody else that you might live with. Goodbye. Yep. And Emma is like, oh. It's so girl mean for a guy to do. Mm -hmm. What's the equivalent here? It's like you rejecting a guy and he invites all your friends to the party except you. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's just like when you're mad at someone and you walk up to them in a group and you say hi to everyone but them. It's awkward for everyone involved, except Mr. Woodhouse, who cannot read the cues. He he just does not notice at all. He's like, oh, my gosh, I hope Mr. Elton's trip goes okay." (laughs) Um, So now Emma is like, well, he's gone. I have got to tell Harriet because she's going to have time now to get over him. This is good. She thinks that uh, telling Harriet, she thinks of it as a penance, which... I looked up, even though I know what penance means, but I wanted to get exactly how bad this is going to be for Emma. And it is a voluntary self-punishment as repentance for having done wrong. She really knows that she fucked up and she knows that this is going to suck balls having to tell Harriet. 
I mean, can you imagine? That's pretty bad. This is what it says in the book about how she feels about what she's done and what she's doing now. She had to destroy all the hopes which she had been so industriously feeding to appear in the ungracious character of the one preferred and acknowledge herself grossly mistaken and misjudging in all her ideas on one subject, all her observations, all her convictions, all her prophecies for the last six weeks. I relate to Emma a little bit here, not only because this is so awful. So this is bad on two levels. One, she hurt her friend, and she has to deal with that. Mm -hmm. But there's one thing I hate more than anything else, and Emma hates it too. Admitting that you're wrong? (laughs) Admitting that you're wrong. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I like to think I have a bit more humility than Emma, but I love being right. I'm very much a Virgo in that way. I'm okay admitting I've done something wrong when I'm like unsure of myself to begin with. Because then I'm like, well, you know, I wasn't sure to begin with. But if I've really like stuck my neck out on something Mm. and I've like advocated for it Mm -hmm. and been like 100 percent sure and I am wrong, that sucks. Yeah. I know where you come from there. Yeah. This is like Emma stood up to nightly sure. Yeah. So Emma does not like it. And Harriet is a mess. She cries. Emma's like, I'm never going to forgive myself. I can't believe I did this to my friend. But Harriet, meanwhile, doesn't blame anyone. She doesn't blame Emma. She proves her ingenuous or innocent disposition and low self-esteem because she thinks that, quote, the affection of a man such as Mr. Elton would have been too great a distinction and nobody but Emma would have thought it was possible. Doesn't your heart just break for this little chicken nugget? Yeah, she's been wronged so fully and she just is like, It was too good to be true. She's just like, well, I'm stupid and ugly and low born. So, of course, he doesn't want me. He's so wonderful. Why would he ever want me? Like, oh, girl. And she really believes that. Or at least I think she does. Well, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to interact with the world. And I I don't want to be too uh, reductive here. But there are two ways to respond to negative information about yourself. One is to project outward and to blame others, and the other is to project inward and blame yourself. You can see here that Harriet is like a thousand percent, not even a question, full and on this spectrum towards blaming herself, Mm -hmm. which is very sad. Yes. (laughs) Because I, I tend to think like not outwardly projecting too much, you're probably, you know, a little full of yourself, not really like taking into account what you need to actually do to like be accountable for things. On the other side of it, if you like blame yourself too much, then you're just letting the world walk all over you. Yeah. Balance. It's all about balance. Wait, wait. The the listeners can hear that I've drunk more of my beer because it'll be a lower note. Should I make a compilation video as we, I mean, not video, but audio as we go through the episode, you just occasionally will. Oh, yeah, totally. And then we can have Graham splice them together into a song. Yeah, Graham, (laughs) you can do that, right? Totally. Yeah, that's easy enough. Oh, boy. So Emma watches Harriet cry and she sees that she's just really affected by this. And she's convinced in that moment that Harriet is the superior creature of the two. And that to resemble her would be more for her own welfare and happiness than all that genius or intelligence would do. Emma in this moment is kind of seeing that poise and cunningness or or uh, whatever you would call what she is isn't everything and that feeling something is important also I mean it's also that it's not just that Harriet feels things it's that she's got a sweetness and a humility to her that is really admirable she she really genuinely has this incredible heart mm-hmm like we know Harriet's not smart right at all and she doesn't have many prospects in life, but she's got just this purely sweet nature. And what Emma's saying there is basically, wow, there are a lot of smart people in the world, but there are very few people as kind and good as Harriet. Yeah. Like, she's so good that this motherfucker who came in and was sleazy and presumptuous and, like, completely threw her heart to the side like it had nothing. She hears all that, and she's like, oh... 
it's my fault. Right. And Emma's thinking, you're too good for this world. She's basically saying out loud, perfect cinnamon roll, too good for this world, too pure. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh, do you remember that meme that looks like a cinnamon roll, but will it actually kill you? No. Wait, yes, it's like, looks like a cinnamon roll will kill you. Looks like they could kill you is a cinnamon roll, et cetera. Yes. And should then, we do that? Yes, but we should wait till we have actors to pair it with. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, but my favorite is cinnamon roll. Like S-I-N. Oh, yes. Cinnamon roll. <laughs> cinnamon roll. So Emma leaves this interaction resolved to never do any more matchmaking yet again and to just like, reel in her imagination and try to live a more quiet, humble life. (laughs) Uh, I don't see that happening. (laughs) She decides that she's going to help Harriet by offering her books and conversation and generally distracting her from thinking of Mr. Elton. Emma's got the rom-coms lined up. She's got the ice cream. She is like, we are tackling this breakup. We're about to have the Bridget Jones drinking montage. Or not drinking montage. The the one where she throws all of her alcohol in the trash and then goes for a jog. You know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about. Shouts to, you know, Sequoia for our uh, yes. epic Bridget Jones excursion. We really did have a long excursion into Bridget Jones, huh? It was was a good one. I love Bridget Jones. Uh, What was I going to say, though? It's like more um, breakup based. You know, the movie I wanted to reference with this was Clueless. (laughs) You can't do that, Becca. I can't do it. But it's like that that montage where the friend comes over and has like the ice cream and the rom-coms and the face masks. And it's like, we're forgetting about him. Mm-hmm. We're going to go out on the town. You're going to find someone new. It's going to be great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I can't believe you almost referenced Clueless. <laughs> anyway. I can't wait for you to watch that one. Oh, I am literally going to poop myself. I'm so excited. <laughs> so Emma doesn't know much about having a crush on anyone. Mr. Elton in particular, she just simply cannot wrap her head around that. But she thinks that by the time he gets back, Harriet will have mostly gotten over him and they'll be able to meet again as common acquaintances. I I don't think Emma really understands emotions, but we'll get there. Harriet still thinks that Elton is just the most perfect man to ever walk this earth. And Emma understands that Harriet might be a little bit more in love with Elton than she actually thought was possible. And she thinks, you know what? It's unrequited. She can't go on feeling like that forever. Oh, Emma. Oh, Emma. (laughs) She just doesn't understand crushes because having an unrequited crush is like it drags on as we know. Oh, I've made it my whole personality for like very long periods of my life. As have I. You, you've you <laughs> been there for that for me. I mean, you've been there for me too. Yeah, we just, <laughs> it happens. And Emma doesn't get that like yearning, that it's about the yearning. Oh, yeah, the yearning. Uh, listeners, I know you also understand the, the yearning. <laughs> yeah, our listeners understand the yearning better than any other listeners. Yeah, you guys do. We love you for it. You relate to us on this level. <laughs> um, she thinks that if they see Elton when he comes back, he'll prove how much he does not love Harriet in his behavior because he he's a dick. And so she knows that it'll be obvious. And Harriet would stop having feelings for him at that time. But she doesn't understand the difference between having feelings for someone and thinking that someone would be a good match. Like in this time period, a lot of people are good matches. Like someone could be the logical choice for you, but it's different than having feelings for them. See, I do actually stop having a crush on someone when they're super mean to me. Well, but I know that's not everyone. That's not everyone. And also like it's Yeah, I mean, in this case, him being mean would be a big turnoff. But, like, I think that Emma thinks this person's a good idea for me. I have feelings for them, i.e. Frank Churchill, for example. She's like, oh, he would be a a logical match for me. But she doesn't know the difference in her body of having feelings for someone versus, like, this is a safe choice. So just something to put in the back of my mind, I think, for later. Absolutely. 
she knows that it's going to be impossible for them to avoid each other once he gets back. And unluckily for Harriet, everyone at Mrs. Goddard's still loves Mr. Elton. So at Hartfield, Emma has to talk about him like talk smack or in this era, talk about him with cooling moderation or repellent truth. Yeah, this is great, though. Like when you everybody likes someone, but you and your friend talk shit about that person, like when no one else is hearing the conversation. Yeah, exactly. And that's the end of that chapter. Hello, hello, hello. I am so sorry to interrupt, but it's me, Molly, from the future, here to bring you a segment that we are now calling The Economics of Podcasting About Jane Austen. So, Graham, the sound effect, please. This week on The Economics of Podcasting About Jane Austen, I'm going to tell you all a little bit about Athletic Greens. They have a product that I use literally every day. It's called AG1. So as a lot of you know, I'm a vegan and I have to take a bunch of different vitamins and supplements all the time. So I started drinking AG1 by Athletic Greens because I wanted to try one that actually tastes good. And it really does. It's kind of sweet, kind of fruity, and it doesn't really taste like a nutritional drink. What I do is I like to fill my AG1 bottle with water every night and put it in the fridge to get really cold. And then in the morning, I add one scoop of AG1, shake it up and drink it. It's super easy. You just take one scoop and you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. I've been drinking it for a couple of weeks now and I found that I have more energy throughout the day and I'm able to focus better while I'm at my day job. And right now, Athletic Greens has a special offer for you guys, our listeners. They're going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase of AG1. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash whomst. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash W-H-O-M-S-T to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. And now let's get back to talking about Jane Austen. Speaking of Frank Churchill. Speaking of Frank Churchill, Mr. Frank Churchill did not come. Womp womp. Womp womp. The ultimate womp womp to start this chapter. I mean, yeah. He writes a letter saying that he's going to come soon and Mrs. Weston is really disappointed. But Mr. Weston is like, oh, well, it'll be better. He'll come when the weather's warmer. He'll be able to stay for longer. This is the best possible outcome for everyone. He's just so pure. He really thinks the best of his son. He really thinks the best of everyone, I think, except for the Churchills. He does not think the best of the Churchills. You can't think the best of the Churchills. He probably thinks the best of the Churchills that's possible. Yeah, yeah. But he does think the best of his son. Meanwhile, Mrs. Weston says, no, he's just going to make another excuse. He's never coming. And Emma, at this point, cannot care less whether Frank Churchill comes or not, which there are a lot of really good lines in this set of chapters where it's just like, oh, this thing is happening. Emma couldn't care less. Or (laughs) like at this point, she's like, I don't give a shit about anything right now. I was wrong. I'm stuck on that. And also I hurt my friend and I'm stuck on that. So whatever to everything else right now. (laughs) Yeah, she is brooding. I love it for her. (laughs) She thinks that uh, or she tries to act like she cares because She wants to, you know, be invested in her friends' lives. And she tells Knightley all about this, you know, acting like she cares. And she's over-exaggerating how upset she is over the fact that he's not coming. I love this. She's like, can you believe (laughs) he would do such a thing? Poor Mr. Weston. Poor Mrs. Weston. The entire chapter is like her being like, just trying to continue the conversation in that exact tone. She's like, oh, but did you know this thing? And it's like, okay. And not to get too far into it too quickly, but her sparring partner is significantly more passionate in this conversation than she is. <laughs> yeah, She's like, I don't know why you're so upset. That's basically the entire chapter is her just fighting for the sake of fighting. And then at the end being like, why are you so angry? She's like, what's happening? Like, what's why is this getting you riled up? And he's just like, I fucking hate him. Yeah. So let's get into their their conversation. And by he, I mean, Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley. This is a very hot conversation. Ugh. It's heated and it's hot. I mean, it's Mr. Knightley, so it's hot. It's hot. It's hot. Uh, yes. Wait, wait, wait. Go on. Beautiful. Also, I want to note that I think the reason that she is engaging so much in this way is to keep the conversation from landing on her because she was wrong. Yeah, pretty much. I mean... <laughs> 
Listen, no one else knows about what happened in the car between Mr. Elton and Emma other than Harriet. That's true. So no one else knows that Emma now thinks Elton's a fuckwad. And Mr. Knightley, importantly, does not know he was 100% right. Right. And I think that Emma doesn't want him to know, but she also doesn't want to lie to him, which is why she's like, let's talk about this other thing. Yeah. Uh, he has no reason to suspect at this point. Right. So she blames the Churchills entirely for keeping Mr. Uh, Frank Churchill away, even though a few chapters ago, she literally made the exact opposite argument to Mrs. Weston saying like, oh, well, he could come, you know, he could come if he wants to. I'm sure he's going to come. And they had had this whole argument already. But she's like, no, the Churchills kept him. And Knightley's like, "Okay, if he wanted to visit, he would. And Emma's like, well, of course they wanted to come, but they won't let him. And Knightley can't believe that Frank doesn't have the power to come if he wants to. He's an adult man. And Emma asks why Knightley thinks Frank so unnatural or like thinks so badly of Frank that he would just choose not to come. And Knightley's like, it's not unnatural that Frank might have started to think too highly of himself from living with people who think too highly of themselves. Which is, you asked me this question a couple episodes ago. I did. You said more Weston or more Churchill. And he, he says in this moment, it's a great deal more natural than one could wish that a young man brought up by those who are proud, luxurious, and selfish should be proud, luxurious, and selfish too. He thinks that Frank is, again, too old to be under the power of his guardian so completely. He is an adult man. He just has all of the power in this situation. Emma says that's easy for Knightley to say because he's always been independent. And Knightley's like, well, we know Frank is not lacking money or leisure. We constantly hear of him out at some watering hole or another. So bars, right? He's a partier. Yeah, he's like a like he's a he's a young party boy having a good time. He's like out and about. He's like he's like not to bring Bridgerton into it, but just to as a reference point in season one. I haven't seen season two, but the brother who's like always out at bars. Yeah, actually, that's a good call. Yeah, I was going to go with Leo DiCaprio in the 90s, but yours was better. <laughs> yes, very good. So Knightley says that they know because they see him out that he can leave the Churchills when he wants to. And I was like, it's not fair to judge someone's conduct without an intimate knowledge of their situation. And maybe sometimes he has more power than other times. Like, it depends on the situation. I think they're both making assumptions about his situation. Emma's assuming in this case, that he has more power sometimes than other times and like thinking that he doesn't have any power in this situation. Knightley is assuming the opposite, but like neither of them actually know his situation at all. You see how Frank Churchill's absence leads to this vacuum where everyone in this town can sort of fill in whatever story they want to about him. Yes, he's a fantasy. Mm -hmm. Mm. Or a nightmare if you're Mr. Knightley. He could be a nightmare dressed like a daydream. Taylor, if you want to come on this podcast. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? No, I cannot imagine what it would be like to have Taylor Swift on this podcast. <laughs> I have no point of reference for that. <laughs> but can you imagine anyway? <laughs> what would we even ask her? I guess that's the how, how Emma feels about Frank Churchill. Like, she has no point of reference, but she makes up what it would be like if he were there. Exactly. Knightley repeats that a man can always do his duty. And if he stood up to Mrs. Churchill and said, listen, lady, it's my duty to go and see my dad. Therefore, I am going to see my dad. Then she just wouldn't stop him. And Emma's like, she might not stop him from going, but she would definitely stop him from coming home, which reminds me of our boy, Eddie. We'll chat about that more in the study questions, won't we? Yes. I love when I draw a correct parallel. Oh, yeah, you did. <laughs> nice. Uh, Emma says someone completely dependent could never talk to their guardian like that. And she says, you have not an idea of what is requisite in situations directly opposite to your own. My question is, does Emma have an idea what is requisite in situations directly opposite to her own? It's possible not. But also, is her point tonightly wrong? Her point's not wrong. Is it? I mean, you could just see a lot of Emma and Knightley talking as just a pot and a kettle going back and forth, yelling that the other one is black. Yeah, that's kind of exactly <laughs> what's happening here. Yeah. 
they're, they're two very privileged people who like to sit around and josh each other about their own privilege. Right. But also, he has maybe a little bit more of an idea about some situations like he's pals with Mr. Martin, for example, and is more likely to talk to people of a lower class than himself. Well, it's it's a question of whether or not Knightley has humility that Emma lacks to know that he might have not experienced things in the world. I don't know about that, at least in this situation, because... In general, if you look at the Mr. Martin of it all, if you yes. look at Harriet and Mr. Elton, but we'll get to it again in the study questions, but there's a question of whether or not he's applying that same logic here. Is he being fair to Frank Churchill? Yeah, I don't think he's being fair in this situation, and we will, I'm sure, talk about it more in the study questions. However, I also don't disagree with him, and I, I'm not sure that I'm on Mr. Uh, Churchill's side, but we'll talk about that later. Knightley thinks that a sensible man would stand up to his aunt and uncle, and that would actually make his aunt and uncle respect him more and feel they could trust him because if he does right by his father, then of course he'll do right by them at another time in, in life. And he thinks that the Churchills know in their hearts that he must do this and go to his dad. And in their hearts, they don't think better of him for being submissive to them in general. And I had this moment where I was like, is Knightley a romantic? And then I had this moment where I was like, did I ask you if Knightley was a romantic before? Because I had I had this memory of being like, ooh, we have a romantic on our hands. And so I went back and I found a page in the book where Knightley was a romantic before. So I'm just going to find it really quick. I love that you scoured what you've read so far of Emma to figure out if Knightley is like a simpy romantic boy. I think he is. I think he has a heart of gold. So this is when he comes in and he's like, Emma, you're never going to believe what happened. And she's like, what are you talking about? Who's in love with Harriet? And he's telling her about Mr. Martin. And he's like, uh, he asked me whether I thought her too young, in short, whether I approved his choice altogether, having some apprehension perhaps of her being considered as in a line of society above him. I was very much pleased with all that he said. I never hear better sense from anyone other than Robert Martin. He always speaks to the purpose, open, straightforward, and very well judging. He told me everything, the circumstances and plans and what they all proposed in doing in the event of his marriage. He is an excellent young man, both as son and brother. I had no hesitation in advising him to marry. <sighs> it was like that moment, I think, that to me said he loves love. So I don't know. I just had to find that. <laughs> you just want an excuse to read another like lovely nightly moment out loud. Yes. So he's a romantic. He says that the Churchill's little minds would bend to Frank's mind. But Emma says that when little minds belong to rich people in positions of power, they tend to swell and become unmanageable. And she says that if Knightley were plopped into Frank's place... The Churchills would have no problem with him going because he doesn't have this history of subservience to them, whereas Frank has his entire life behind him, so they're not going to just like let him change and go now. I actually have a quote. Oh, the difference of situation and habit. I wish you would try to understand what an amiable young man may be likely to feel in directly op opposing those whom, as a child and a boy, he has been looking up to all his life. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's just a really strong portion of the book to talk about, like, the nature versus nurture of a boy like Frank Churchill, who was born into a certain circumstance, but was raised far above his own status. Mm -hmm. It kind of blew up his head a little bit. Not only that, it also put him in a position where there's the conflict of who he is and who he's been raised to be. Right. Who's his actual family? Yeah. Who are his parents? Who are anyone's parents in this book? I mean, Mr. Woodhouse is Emma's parent. Yes, but who are Harriet's parents? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> Who's Elton's parents? Well, they exist somewhere. They're I'm somewhere. Sure. But yes, who are his parents and who is he? Um, that's a big part of this. And he says Elton is a weak young man if this is the first time he's ever tried to oppose his aunt and uncle. Churchill. Did I say Elton? God damn it. 
<laughs> uh, men. Men. I'm leaving it in. And Mr. Knightley says, I can allow for the fears of the child, but not the man. Like, he, again, he is an adult man. And Emma thinks that he can't be a weak young man because Mr. Weston is a better judge of character than that. And Mr. Weston loves his son and really thinks the best of him, like we said at the beginning of this chapter. She says Frank may be more yielding, mild, and complying than Mr. Knightley's tastes lean towards, but that might give him some advantages in life. And Knightley comes back with a zinger. This part from Knightley is so fucking savage and dramatic. Uh Uh-huh. Like, damn boy. Would you like to read it? Oh, yes, I would. Let me pull it up. So Emma says that having... Uh, a mild manner and slight uh, easygoing temperament might make him distasteful to Knightley, but it'll give him advantages in life. Knightley responds, yes, all the advantages of sitting still when he ought to move and of leading a life of mere idle pleasure and fancying himself extremely expert in finding excuses for it. He can sit down and write a fine flourishing letter full of professions and falsehoods and persuade himself that he has hit upon the very best method in the world of preserving peace at home and preventing his father's having any right to complain. His letters disgust me. He hates him. I know. It's like what you're saying is right. Emma's kind of like arguing for the sake of arguing a little. Mm -hmm. And Knightley's just like. Ian, he's like viciously hating. I f- I'm picturing her like sitting on the couch with her legs crossed, sipping a cup of tea and watching him as he just like paces back and forth being angry and she just like occasionally stokes the fire. I mean, have you ever like had a relationship where you banter with someone and you just get watch them get more and more worked up? It's so fun. I <laughs> uh, see to me, I get anxious when that happens. Like I can't enjoy that. So I would start to think that Knightley actually hates me. Oh no, Molly. I was thinking more along the lines of like Mike ranting to me about something in a video game I don't give half a shit about and me just like prodding him. That is very fun. Yeah. Yes. Hang on. Wow. Really making progress. Yeah. So Emma says that everyone else likes Mr. Churchill's, Mr. Frank Churchill's letters. And Mr. Knightley says Mrs. Weston doesn't because she is in the position of, you know, being a motherly figure to him, but she doesn't have any of the motherly affection. So she's not blinded to it. So she can see who he really is. He thinks that if Mrs. Weston had been a person of consequence, Frank would have come. And then he says something which I think is a stretch. And I wanted to read it. I know exactly what you're going to read, too. (laughs) He says, no, Emma, your amiable young man can be amiable only in French, not in English. (laughs) He must be very amiable, have very good manners and be very agreeable. But he can have no English delicacy towards the feelings of other people. Nothing really amiable about him. Which is just tough. Which doesn't make any sense. (laughs) Like in French, amiable. I'm not going to ad- attempt my French accent, but amiable, uh, uh, aimé, to like, likable, a likable person. He can be likable. Amiable, maybe. Maybe. But in f- English, amiable, does it mean something different? Like, like well bred and like. I think he's saying, and I could be wrong, but this might be a Jane Austen quip. I think he's saying. That would be cool if we were culturally French and you could afford to be cruel to people, but cool and kind, like polite and everything. But we're English and you have to be deeper in your roots than that in your niceness. Oh, she's it's a slight at the French. I think it's a slight at the French. I thought it was a language thing. He was getting all linguisty. No, I think it's a culture thing. That's kind of funny. you know, not necessarily accurate on either front. Not going to not going to endorse Jane Austen's xenophobia. Right, 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 right. But, <laughs> you know, a loving quip towards the French, perhaps. Yes, exactly. More just a more just a barb at the French. That's kind of funny. All right. I like that. I was like, what is he talking about? No, he's saying because if you were French, he could get away with being kind of an asshole underneath all his polite airs. But he's English and he has to be a better to his family. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. No slights to our French listeners. So 
Emma says that Knightley is determined to think ill of Frank and they should stop talking about it. And Knightley is like, mm, I don't, I'm not determined to think ill of him. If he had any merits, then I would acknowledge them. <laughs> he just doesn't, <laughs> which is savage. And Emma's like, well, you know, when he comes, he's going to be the talk of the town because it's so rare that we get a well-bred, agreeable young man in town zinger towards Knightley. And Knightley's like, well, if he can hold the conversation, I'll be glad to make acquaintance with him. But if not, I'm not going to think of him at all. And Emma says that she thinks Frank is the kind of person who can hold a conversation with anybody. For example, he'll probably talk about farming with uh, Mr. Knightley and drawing and music with Emma. And I think this means that he's fake, personally. We'll see. I also don't think she has any grounds on which to make this assumption about him. Uh, Again, she is pontificating about what it would be like if Taylor Swift would guest star on her podcast. Yes, exactly. She's like, oh, when he comes, like he's going to know what to talk about with everyone. He's perfect. And Knightley is like, if he can really hold a conversation with anyone about anything, he's a... He is a practiced politician and he's going to try to one up everyone in their own areas of expertise and it's going to be the worst. You might say he's a little clueless. No, Emma says it. Emma says it. You might say he's a little prejudiced. Not in this title, but it's in another title. It's an A title. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) She says... We're both prejudiced. Me for him, you against him. And Knightley is like, I'm not prejudiced. I don't know about you. I'm not me, not me. And Emma's like, okay, well, I am. I'm prejudiced in his favor because of my love for the Westons. I think that's a little bit weird because he has hurt the Westons. Like, well, yeah, but they're his family. Yeah, but he's mean to them. Yeah, but they love him. I don't get it. I get it, but I don't get it, you know? You love the people your people love, you know? Yeah, but I also would be mad at the people who, like, slight my friends and don't come to visit. Like, if I would be mad at someone's boyfriend if he blew off his his girlfriend who was my friend. Like, I would be mad at him. But I wouldn't think you were crazy if you were determined to like him anyway if he was important to your friend. You're right. Mm. Mm. As I've said, I love being right. <laughs> Anyway, at this point, Knightley is like, well, I don't ever think about him at all. So how can I be prejudiced against him? Like, he he takes up none of my brain space. I love this. I love this. We've had a chapter about him. I know. It's amazing. And I was like, okay, let's talk about something else now. Uh, But she's like, why is he angry? And the way it ends is she thinks that for all Knightley's high opinion of himself, she never thought that it could make him unjust to the merit of another. So we're left with the mystery of why does Knightley hate Frank Churchill so much? A great question. And that brings us to Becca's study questions. Uh, Starting with Elton's departure, do you think he's coming back? Unfortunately, I do. And only because I have seen, and I wanted to make this, uh, put this out there into the universe that I've seen on the social media is the mention of the Eltons and a Mrs. Elton. So I don't know what who it's referring to. I always scroll past really fast when I see something like that. But I do think he is coming back and I do think he will uh, have a wife. I don't know who the wife will be. I will neither confirm nor deny. Harriet's reaction to the Elton thing. What does it tell us about Harriet? She has a really low opinion of herself. She did really have feelings for the guy and she probably will continue to. Yeah. I also think it shows some of the precariousness of her position in society. Yes. She kind of needs to pin her hopes on one guy and she's in a bad spot without a man. Yeah. And she's kind of having this realization of like, that was dumb of me to aspire to that with him. Yeah. It also so, does show much to the sweetness of her nature. Totally. What a bean. What does it tell us about Emma? What does his leaving or her reaction? Her reaction. Emma's reaction, I said it before and I'll say it again, shows us that I don't think she has any idea 
about what it feels like to be in love or to have a crush on someone. And it shows her privilege that she, you know, she got Harriet all worked up for this guy. And she's like, it's okay. She's going to bounce back. At the same time, though, at the same time, we should acknowledge that she really does feel guilty for hurting her friend. And she really does understand what she did that was wrong. She doesn't understand necessarily the extent to which, like, this would have changed Harriet's life. And now it's just devastated her um but she definitely had her moment of oh crap I was wrong so that's good for her so it's kind of a mixed bag for Emma as usual she's complicated always is and I totally agree I was definitely thinking about her privilege in this scene particularly because you know Emma's forced to reckon with the consequences of her whims and her cleverness and her little antics in a real substantial way she got her friend's heart broken yeah and humiliated yeah it's not just like she can't just play with her people like they're toys exactly she's seeing the consequences of that for the first time will frank come no i don't know he's got to get eventually but i don't think it's going to be in any kind of planned way and it's definitely not going to be in a couple months when he says Honestly, I would love if he never came. That would be hilarious. Waiting for Gatto, Jane Austen edition. Exactly. Yeah. Can Frank come? (sighs) Yeah, I do think he can. I think I am more inclined to lean towards Knightley on this one. Uh, Oh, God. I don't know. Can he? Because, all right. Can I loop in Eddie here? Yes, I would love if you loop in Eddie here. So Edward Ferrers, our sweet, sweet little chicken nugget of a man. Our compost. Our compost. He is. He's like moldy chicken. (laughs) Moldy chicken nugget. Our moldy chicken nugget. He was stuck in a situation and he did what was right, which was to reveal his marriage to... Lucy or his engagement to Lucy Steele, right? So he does this thing that he thinks is honorable but goes against what his very overbearing mother wants and she says, "Fine, go marry her, don't come back." And he loses everything. Like every like all his fortune, he just loses it. And Mr. Frank Churchill comes from a family that didn't have a lot. And then got scooped into a family that has a lot. And he doesn't want to lose a lot. So now I don't know what to do, (laughs) what to say about him. First of all, excellent cross analysis of Jane Austen. I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I think it's, it's a little presumptuous of Knightley to say that he has total control because he's a man and he can do what he wants. We have seen situations where men lose things in those situations. Eddie is a great comp here because Eddie's entire life was mapped out for him because of expectations. And those expectations made his fortune contingent on his obeying his cruel mother. And if you want to go a more sympathetic route to the person in charge, you have Willoughby, who also lost everything when he did not comply with his aunt. Yeah. You can lose your fortune if you're a man in this time. So Keeping his aunt and uncle happy is certainly something that Frank Churchill has to do at the same time. To be fair to Mr. Knightley, Eddie went to marry a poor girl. Willoughby knocked up a teenager. (laughs) Like, Frank is trying to visit his dad. Right, he's going to come back. So really, the question is, how cruel are the Churchills? Are they really so cruel that they would hold these stakes over their son, quote unquote, that were hanging over Eddie for like the biggest decisions in his life? Or is Frank using their rudeness and their meanness and their selfishness as excuses to blow off his father over and over again? Excuses, excuses. I, I don't know yet, but I think I have a feeling That Frank has gotten comfortable in the life that he is living. And he's like, oh, sorry, I can't. My mom said no. Or my my aunt said no. This goes to our next question. Who's right, Emma or Knightley or neither? 
I think it's somewhere in between. I think that Knightley is most right. Like, he has more well-thought-out points than Emma because she is just arguing for argument's sake and doesn't necessarily even believe everything that she is saying. But she does hit on some good points, which are... Nightly, do you really understand someone in this situation? You have an estate, you are in charge of your own shit, and you have been for a really long time. Born to a better class. He's born into a better class. And then another point that she hits on is that it's not like all one or the other. Like sometimes he might have more sway in decisions than others. The rest of the things that she says are a little bit like everything in the second half where she's like, Well, I trust him because Mr. Weston trusts him. And like, I just feel like she's blowing smoke out of her butt for some of it. But some really good points. One being Knightley doesn't truly know. Also, the history there is definitely a big one um, that he has grown up in this this situation and has been this way for so long. Knightley makes the point that like he shouldn't have been this way for so long. But Emma says he has been this way for so long. So to break out of that now is hard. And then... The fact that there's a spectrum, like, yes, his family lets him go out and party, uh, but they might not let him see his estranged father because they don't want him leaving. And, you know, what if they what if what if he likes his dad more than he likes them? I don't know. That's probably not it. But (laughs) I mean, there's a lot of different things they could be worried about, including like where their money is going. Oh, yeah. They could also he could be lying to them about where he's going and um, and partying, too. Do you think? Well, I meant more like that, that uh, Mr. Weston was going to try to take Frank's money. Oh, they could be worried about Mr. Weston taking Frank's money. So that's a point. That's a point. I don't think that's a point that Emma made or that Knightley made, but that's definitely something to think about. And then also, does he go out and party with their permission? I feel like probably not. So like a good question. Yeah. Um, so you talked about how Emma made some, uh, points that were kind of her blowing smoke up out of her own ass or what, was that what she said? Yeah. That is what I said. Yeah. So, uh, on the other side of that, clearly, uh, Knightley has a specific edge to this argument. Why does Knightley hate Frank Churchill? I don't know. That was like, it's surprising to me because he really did have an opinion and he was sticking with it. And I don't know if they must have some sort of history, or something, um, or if he has some sort of history with the family, maybe I am starting to just like, I like the fire between these two, Emmett Knightley. And so maybe he knows that she likes Frank Churchill, even though like she doesn't know him at all. But he's like, why do you like him but I feel like he's he's more poised than that in general so I don't feel like he would get so worked up over a crush but maybe he's a romantic so either something to do with Emma or some sort of history with the family or or something I feel like he's I feel like he's done some sort of Darcy like lurking in the shadows and finding out all the secrets of everybody thing before and I feel like he knows something that Emma doesn't, maybe, but he hasn't revealed it yet. Well, not confirm nor deny. Last question before the standbys. I have uh, themes from volume the first. We'll go through a couple rapid fire. Um, your thoughts on class status and power this far in the book? It's definitely all like it's rooted in whether or not one needs to marry and how that person can marry. I think those are the big ones because Harriet needs to marry and Emma does not need to marry and Mr. Martin needs to marry probably. Uh, and we forgot about him. I mean, he, he doesn't, I don't know. He wants to. Not like to. Harriet needs to marry. He has his own income. He has his own and he wants to marry. It's all about love, Ugh, but we're talking about status. Yes. Harriet needs to marry. Emma does not need to marry. Where else do the class dynamics live in this story so far? Um, the Churchills and the Westons. Um, the <clears throat> between Emma and Harriet. Oh, 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 oh! Between Emma and Harriet, the friendship. Oh one. my God! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> between Emma and Harriet with their friendship. Yes, yes. And uh, thoughts on that so far? It's interesting 
because I think so we haven't seen a friendship across class statuses before. We've seen romances across class statuses. So it's like Emma I mean it still comes back to marriage because Emma wants to get Harriet married off um as opposed to her own self getting her married off, but she like wants to bring her up to her class status and Emma is blinded a little bit or a lot of it because she sees Harriet as equal to herself or like you know, a little bit less, but she's like, she's of my, you know, social circle when she's just straight up not. And it's leading to some problems for Harriet, I think. Does she see her as equal to herself? Not to herself. In my view of these chapters so far, what we see is genuine affection between these two, but also a clear way in which Emma is using a friend of lower status to feel like a little better and have someone who will not challenge her so much. Mm. whereas Harriet's getting a boost up to another class and they both kind of know that. Yeah. Now, obviously, Emma's not as cognizant as others might be of these total differences, but she knows that she's got someone who will follow everything she says because she's of lower status. And she loves when people listen to her. Exactly. She hates being wrong. She loves being right. Uh, The nature of love as a theme so far. We've gotten our first heroine who isn't, like, looking for marriage. I mean, Lizzie Bennet wasn't looking for marriage, but she wanted to. She was was reading romance novels, like. Lizzie Bennet also needed to marry. And Lizzie Bennet needed to marry. Emma does not need to marry. She doesn't want to marry. And she has no idea what love means. Like, she just doesn't have a concept. She knows what family love is. She knows what friendship is love is but she has no idea about romantic love and she doesn't really have a desire for it um but I think that that clouds her judgment because she thinks she can like meddle in other people's lives and she doesn't know how it affects them like with Harriet she's like you know playing with her little toys and she doesn't see that this actually like I mean now she sees but she doesn't understand she doesn't empathize with how that feels to have your heart broken what we've also seen is a lot of fantasy love Mm -hmm. In these chapters, Emma has been making up love stories between people around her. She's been fantasizing about Frank Churchill. She gets Harriet to fantasize about the idea of Elton, who was fantasizing about the idea of Emma. A lot of people are thinking about love, but very few people are falling in love at this point in the book. Yeah. On that note, institution of marriage. Mm. It's definitely an institution in this. (laughs) I love you. (laughs) Go on. (laughs) Just in that, like, it is something that either needs to happen or does not need to happen. And the only person who's, like, wanted it was Mr. Martin and probably Harriet. Mm, I miss Mr. Martin. But anyway, Mr. Uh, Woodhouse hates it. He's like, why would anyone get married and leave their father? Emma just purely views it as an economic or like social thing that happens. Grand the sound effect. The economics of dating in Jane Austen. I did it. I found one. (laughs) Yes. Um, I also would say like there's ways in which Emma has said she will not marry unless she's actually in love. And she sees everyone around her getting into these marriages that seem to her worthless compared to what her life is. Right. There's no step up for her. And she can't picture herself falling in love with anyone. She can't picture herself partnering with anyone unless it's worth it through love. All she has is this model of imperfect marriage. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, barring the Westons who she set up as a love match. Right, I forgot she set them up. Or she thinks she set them up. She thinks she set them up. But in her brain, she set them up as a love match. Mm -hmm. Most, I mean, most people are not happy in marriage in this time period. She's, again, a bit of a revolutionary. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that she will only marry if she's in love. Because I do remember her saying that. But what stuck with me was her thinking, if I were to marry, it would probably be to this man that I've never met. Yes, her boy band crush. Right. She just wants something unattainable because she doesn't want to attain it, I don't think. 
Interesting. All right, standbys. What do you think of Emma? Well, she's complicated. <laughs> I don't know. She's got, she is in this chapter, the set of chapters, she's going through a whirlwind. She has been wrong for the first time and she's arguing just for, for shits and gigs and also to keep the topic away from her being wrong. Um, and she's trying to see the best in people and see the worst in some people, the best in other people. I, I don't know. I love her. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Funniest quote. Okay. There were a lot of, like I said, good like paragraph openers and they're all dependent on their context. But the first chunk, there's the letter coming from Elton to her dad saying he's leaving for a couple weeks. And the next pa- paragraph starts with Emma was most agreeably surprised. Amazing. And then later on, a couple paragraphs later when they're like, Emma really thought that the way she was blatantly missing from the letter from Elton to her dad would tip him off that something happened. And then the next chap, the next paragraph says it did not, however. And then later, later on, the next chapter just starts with Mr. Frank Churchill did not come. Great opening to a chapter. Uh, questions moving forward. Okay. Is Elton coming back? With whom? or whomst, if you will. Will Frank Churchill ever come, like you asked? Will Harriet find someone else? Will Mr. Martin come back? Is Emma going to resume matchmaking? Yeah, I think those are them. Who wins the chapters? Oh, man. I'm torn between Knightley and Emma. I had a third. Oh, who was yours? Harriet. Because she had her little heart broken? And she just showed up with nothing but good grace, poor girl. Yeah. Yeah, she can she can have a sympathy win. Um, and she did handle it very well. Uh, though I feel I feel like I want her to stand up for herself more, but she'll learn. And then I'm gonna give Knightley his win for the second chapter just for being hot. Always fair. <laughs> Always love a Knightley's hot win. All right. That concludes this pretty long episode of uh, Pod and Prejudice. For next week, you are either going to read the first two chapters of volume the second, chapters one and two, or depending on your copy, chapters 19 and 20. Molly, how are you feeling? I'm so excited. I'm ready to dive in. Let's go. All right. Well, until next time, stay proper. And write a really savage goodbye letter that doesn't even mention the person that you're leaving. Perfect. Pod and Prejudice is edited by Molly Burdick and audio produced by Graham Cook. Our show art is designed by Torrance Brown. Our show is transcribed by Speech Docs Podcast Transcription. For transcripts and to learn more about our team, check out our website at podandprejudice.com. To keep up with the show, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pod and Prejudice. If you love what you hear, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash podandprejudice to see how you can support us or just drop us a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.